What do real friends do? Think about that for just a moment. You know, in TV shows and such, like when you're a real friend, you say like, I'd take a bullet for you, right? Or I'd send a bullet for you. On your behalf, <laughs> I would take somebody else out. Like real friends, what are they really willing to do? And, and I, those are a little extreme, right? Take a bullet, receive a bullet. Generally speaking, that's just not the norm today. That's not the average behavior of common people. But real friends, what will they do? They'll like you in spite of your faults. They'll what? Tell you the truth? Ah. Real friends will, will be open and honest with you, will allow you to share yourself with them, will hear from you, and you'll receive from them. That There's an open exchange back and forth about many things, right? Real friends and four true friends would, would also, if they heard that you could be healed and you were hurting, they would, they would do everything they could to make sure you had that healing. Now today, what would that look like? Go fund me, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, I'm not a miracle worker, but... Today, a good friend would probably set up a GoFundMe account to help you with all of your medical bills, right? And then they'd take care of you as you struggled through your, your deal. They would take you to where you needed to be to take care of that, right? So as we think about true friends and how, how to really care for another, why don't we begin with prayer? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to come before you, to hear your word, uh, to be involved with you and with our brothers and sisters here. God, for those who aren't yet a part of this group, we pray that their hearts would be open, that they would hear and know your message, just like all of us. We all, including me, need to hear from you. So may my words be yours and your words be mine. May we all hear well. In Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so... Um, Mark 2, we're going to walk back through the text that was just read. Mark 2, 1 through 12. And, and keep in mind, um, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, has, has a, an attitude about it. It's like, hurry up, let's go. We're in a hurry, we've got to get this done. There's a continual, and, and the next thing that happened, and oh my, and it's overwhelming, and, and all these things. It's just like the, the speediest, like fastest gospel. It's the shortest gospel, and it, it does a lot of stuff real quick. Everything's how fast can we get it done? So in chapter 1 of Mark, there's a whole bunch of healings that happen just after the temptation of Jesus. And, and really, Mark doesn't even deal with the birth of Jesus. It's like, that's nah, not too important. Let's just rush through, <laughs> right? And, and then there's all these healings and all these people getting healed and, I mean, all kinds of great stuff. And then Mark chapter 2 kicks off with uh, this healing of a, a man who's born paralyzed, apparently. And... Um, so in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. This is where he grew up. This was his hometown. He'd gone out there doing all kinds of miracles. And some people hate this, but I mean, he was at the level of a rock star. I mean, he, he was famous. Everybody around was wanting to sing his song, cheer him on, join in. I mean, if you were his friend, you were like, yeah, man, I knew him when he was just a little guy, right? And as he's growing up, and now he's of age, he's 30, and he's going around acting like a rabbi, and everybody's going, who is he? Where did he get this? He didn't study that. And so people are picking sides. But he comes home, and at home, they're crowding. How many is the most people you've ever had in your house for a party? I mean, have you had standing room only? Like, you couldn't sit down on the couch because <laughs> you would just have somebody's uh, front or backside in your face, and it would be uncomfortable. So everybody just stood the whole time and just was like, hey, yeah, yeah, this is a great party. <laughs> One time when I was a new preacher and I was quite young and I had a small house, I invited many of the area church's younger people to my home. And it was so hot in the house. It was the middle of winter. I'm, Buffalo, New York, we had to open the doors. and I st 
It's not wise to turn on the air conditioning when it's freezing outside. It does not function the way it's supposed to, and it can damage the system. But, but we opened the doors and the windows because it was just crowded. And this is kind of what happened to Jesus. He came home. And you, you couldn't get in. You couldn't get out. It was crowded. It was thick with people. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. So here, everybody's gathering, and they're lined up outside the door just to get a look in, and probably the windows, and probably anywhere that they can hear. And keep in mind, the houses were built differently back then, so the windows weren't triple pane and all that stuff. I mean, you could hear pretty well. And if he was speaking loudly and everyone was quiet, his voice would carry. <clears throat> and, um, but they were just, I mean, imagine that kind of a crowd gathering around your house. How would that feel? And what would the neighbors do? <laughs> what do you think of the neighbors? The neighbors know it's Jesus. They know he's come home. And they're, they're probably also crowding in. It's probably the whole community gathered because as this crowd comes, they're not quiet. I mean, think about it. If somebody's having a party on your street, you hear, don't you? It, it doesn't take long and you're looking out your window. What's going on? What are they doing out there? What, what's, who, how many cars? They've got too many cars. Let's not meet the HOA, right? <laughs> or, hey, this is a safety violation. They're blocking my driveway. You, you, you quickly realize that this is a bigger party than normal. And you might, you might either think, I didn't, did I get invited? Is this an invitation thing? Should I, should I go out? And, and can you imagine the neighbors there? And then some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. So here's a man that's been paralyzed probably from birth, I'm guessing, if not for quite a long time. Everybody knows him. And th these guys are carrying him on, a, on his mat, his cot, his stretcher, however you want to term it. And they're just, you know, bringing him along. And they're like, oh, we can't get in. Can't, can't get in. <laughs> Hey, can, can we get in? And nobody will move out of the way because they're all busy listening to Jesus, right? Since they could not get to him or get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. Now, the interesting thing about this is just that verse before, Jesus came home. And I was reading in a commentary that this was likely Jesus' own house. That's... I, I hadn't heard that before. And I thought, well, that yeah, could be. It could also be one of his disciples' houses, right? Peter? Because they're from this area, too. They're all Galileans, right? And so, but somebody's digging through a roof of somebody's house that's close to Jesus, if not Jesus' own family home. Kind of kind of crazy. Kind of, uh, what? And then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. So, you, you, you know, crowded super crowded, and suddenly you hear noise from above, everything's being peeled back, or are they breaking open things? Do they have to lift up timbers? I mean, what are they doing to get through this? And, and what kind of a roof was it? Was there already a little opening in the roof like some houses had? Because you had to get up to the roof, right? Because many houses had a, an opening so you could be on the roof because that was a part of life. If it's too hot in the house, you slept on the roof back in the day. And so they can't get the guy in, so they're ripping apart the roof, and it's coming down. The, the little pieces of whatever, it's not stucco, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not shingles, but it's, it's hay and straw and maybe thatch. I mean, what kind of roof did they use? And, and they're just ripping it apart, taking it apart. Are they being gentle? Are they being careful? Is Jesus going, hey, hey, uh, no, not, no, yeah, that one. But can you imagine in the middle of Jesus' teaching, somebody, it'd be like all of a sudden somebody coming through the roof right now. That'd be weird, right? It's just not normal. And yet, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I highlighted underline, uh, italicized there. Why would I do that? It's because we typically say, oh, no, no, it's you and you alone. You make the decision to follow Jesus. You decide if you're going to be faithful or not. You and you alone must choose. 
Well, here, there's four guys carrying one guy, right? And Jesus looked at their faith. Collective faith. Have you considered that maybe your friends influence your faith? And that maybe there's some part of you that is wrapped up in the community of faith around you or the lack thereof? Have you considered that maybe your salvation isn't dependent on you alone, but in some sense you are saved through the faith of the, the whole church, the faith of your closest friends? And it's a very foreign concept for us, I know. And it's because we're just incredibly individualistic. We are, we are so wrapped up in me, my, mine, and I will take care of it. It's my choice, my decision. But that is a very, very, very new concept in the, in the scope of humanity. I mean, think about it. You, you go back how many years and you had to have a tribe. You had to have a group of people that were around you or else you were almost dead for certain, right? You had to have somebody that you belonged to and that, that, that belonged to you as well. And, and, and those people helped you live or Die. And you fought with those people, for those people, and, and, and it was your community. It was your group. And that's why it was such a big deal when somebody said, you're not a part of this family anymore. Get out. Today, you can still live a life. You can still survive. Go back a few hundred years, and it would be much, much more difficult, especially a few thousand years. And now you're talking about... If you're not a part of a family, a part of a group, a part of a, a you're, you're, you're likely going to really have a hard time because you're an outcast. You're no longer. You don't have anyone to watch your back. And so their faith was incredibly important to Jesus, so much so that he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And he forgave him. Now, in the Talmud, which is a uh, rabbinic reference and interpretation of the Torah from the 2nd to 5th centuries, roughly, it, they have this saying that, that kind of stems from this time, because remember, that's a body of tradition, and they've, been tr they've, they've had that tradition for a very long time before that 2nd to 5th century writing down of it, because they've been referencing Rabbi so-and-so, Rabbi so-and-so, and they would say this, you cannot get off your sickbed until your sins are all forgiven. That's an interesting thought. You will not be getting up until your sins are forgiven. And, uh, hmm, that's, that's, uh, I don't remember that anywhere in Scripture. But at the same, we read in the, in the book of James, the letter that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote, that your sins can be forgiven and your, your body can be healed by the prayers of the righteous, Right? And so it's important that we also take note that sometimes your sickness is wrapped up in, in your, your theology, your thinking, your, your self-awareness. Have you ever heard of anybody that went into a catatonic state? Like something happened in their life and they just whoop, and they basically froze. And, and, and mentally they shut down. They could no longer function. There's one lady that she was watching a TV show. Uh, it wasn't a show, actually. It was a live re recording of somebody who got shot and died or stabbed and died. And she lost the use of her legs instantaneously. Somehow she felt responsible for it. And it took two years of somebody helping her to, to finally say, hey, look, look, that was not your fault. You didn't kill that person and you have no connection to that. You just watched it. And then she was, oh. And she got up and walked. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? But there's also the story of Patch Adams. Robin Williams played a doctor who helped people get liberated from their frozen state. That catatonic state where they could no longer function. And once they were released, they were alive again. And, and sometimes that's just simply in our heads. And sometimes we do it to ourselves. Have you ever told yourself, I can't? Oh, I just can't. And you, you, you really can't now. 
Have you, have you ever said, oh, this is really hard for me. This is so hard. This is so difficult. And then, like, you just couldn't do it. Whatever it was, you're like, I can't. And then it wasn't but a few days later, you forgot that you couldn't, and then you did. <laughs> and you went, oh, I, I, I guess I can. So, sometimes we are self-limiting, incredibly so. But I would say in the case of this man, th there's a double whammy here. He's got something going on. And Jesus is, is helping him in more than one way. So, now, some teachers of the law were there. They were sitting there and then thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when you hear that, you have to ask yourself, how did Jesus hear what was going on in their heads? Because that's what the Greek also means. Like, they didn't speak this out loud, and if they did, they whispered it in so hush a tone that nobody around them knew what was being said or thought. And yet Jesus, who is the Son of God, also can hear them. And immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit, within himself, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, Take your mat and walk. Like, wow. Je Jesus is saying, there's words and then there's actions. And who, Which one's easier? Just to say a few words? Or to also mean those words? Because you can say something and not mean it, but if you say it and mean it, that's huge, isn't it? And then if there's action behind it, that's what Jesus is saying. My words have power. And they have action behind them. And, and Jesus says this, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so the Son of Man comes from, is it Daniel? One of the prophets in the Old Testament, right? And he, and he reminds them that he is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. He is telling them up front, you've seen all these miracles. You saw all that was done. This, this shouldn't shock you. I mean, listen to my teaching. And he's not boasting or bragging. He's saying, I am the chosen one. I'm the son of man. This is a title that is, wow, right? I have authority on earth to forgive sins and to do so much more. The authority to forgive sins is only the beginning. And Jesus comes as one who is the jubilee for all. And what does that mean? He's going to set the captives free, heal the sick, Cure the blind, right? The, the, the lame will walk. The deaf will hear. He's, and he's going to change everything that you've ever thought you understood. So he said to them, or to the man that is, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Whoa. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Like a known entity, paralyzed, unable to move, like, is done. Like, he is a drain on his family. He's a drain on everybody around him as far as financial means, right? The guy cannot provide in any real way. And suddenly he's up and walking and he's back a part of the whole world, the culture, the society, the, the friends, the family. Everybody goes, this is, this, this is, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like this because there's two, three miracles at once. The first one is he's forgiven. Wow. The second one is that his legs will now work, right? And the third is that he doesn't have to learn to walk again. How many of you have had some accident and you had some surgery or had some hip replaced or joint replaced or some, something else? Or you broke something and then you had to go to therapy to learn to walk again. He doesn't need therapy. He's up and running. I, I'm, I'm sure he danced all the way home, Right? I mean, this is amazing. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is, this is beyond our imagination. We, we didn't think this would happen. We, we never saw this coming. What, what does this mean? How do we handle this? What do we do with it? This is, this is too much. <clears throat> And it's too much that I'm done with my sermon too early. I'm sure you're all bothered by that. You're upset. You're frustrated. We're at the end of this sermon, and we're only a few minutes in. <sighs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but faith challenges are, this sermon's not over. You, 
If you've been here before, you know that this is where I say, let's apply this. Let's take it home with us. And I, I have a big take home for you, okay? Uh, group faith. The first thing is your group matters. Your group incredibly matters. I am fully convinced that our individualism is rather unhealthy. I am fully convinced that how much we place an importance on me, myself, and my, and mine, and, and I can do it by myself, and I'm going to take care of it, and I, I just got to stand up, pull myself up by my bootstraps. No, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps is nonsense. There's something about it that's good, sure, but I am fully convinced that the Bible has a different ethos about it, an ethos of community, a saying of, no, 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 let me help you with your boots. Let me love you. Let me bless you. Let's do this together. And I am convinced that none of us can be saved all by ourselves. First off, we have to have Jesus. <laughs> you can't save yourself and I can't save myself. Second, there are way too many one another's in the New Testament to just ignore the community of faith and to say that I can do it by myself. I'll go for a hike, I'll go for a walk, I'll go off on, on, and be on the beach or in the woods or in the mountains. N nonsense. There is a community of faith that is necessary. We need one another. And second, this is where I'm really going to get practical. Can you name four friends? Are there four friends in this community who you can go to who would bring you to Jesus if you were paralyzed and Jesus suddenly showed up in town and would heal you? Or let, let's put it in today's term. Do you have four friends that would write your GoFundMe account, and if they didn't know how, they'd find somebody who could, you know, the kid down the street, and they would get them and, and, and have them write up your GoFundMe page? Do you have four of those friends? Okay, so here's your homework. And if, and if you don't have four of those friends, are you one of those friends? Do you have four people that that you would go to and help and love in that way, that they call you in the middle of the night, middle of the day, anytime, whether you're at work, at home, with family, with friends, whoever, you would drop it and take care of them. You would help them. Here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I want you to put your name at the top. We're going to hand these out in just a moment. Uh, there, and then name an address of friend number one, two, three, and four. And you're going to say, what? No, no, no. I'm not giving you. It's just for me. And I'm just going to do a simple thing. And it's really easy. It's not difficult. <clears throat> I'm going to send an invitation to these friends of yours on your behalf. The church is going to do this for you. We're going to write your name and say, Dear, fill in the blank of your four friends that live in town. You, if you want to invite somebody from Colorado, that's fine. <laughs> but they may not come. <laughs> right? And it may be a little far away. So think of four people that live near you and name an address. And here's what I'm going to say. Dear so-and-so, you are a great friend to this individual. They want you to come to church with them on this Sunday so that you can, can uh, enjoy their company and hear a, a nice message. And we're going to keep it really simple and kind of generic. And, and it's an invitation on your behalf. But here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you ahead of time so you're not surprised. I'm going to re-preach the same message. And then I'm going to tell everybody, you're here because you are one of those kinds of friends. You are one of those kinds of people that they love you, they care about you, and they would love for you to be in their life in a deeper, more profound way. And God calls us to live in community with one another. So in a month or two, <clears throat> however long it takes me to write out all the invitations, <laughs> and whoever wants to help me with this, please do, tell me. Um, and we're just going to invite, we're going to invite friends to come to church and to know that they are loved and that we count them as good quality people that we want in our lives in a deeper, more profound way and that we need their help for our daily life and that we appreciate them. And at the same time, um, invite them to, you know, be involved in the deepest part of your life, what hopefully is the deepest part of your life, your faith in Jesus. And, and say, hey, they love you enough that if you're not a part of the family of God, 
If you're not a Christian, if you don't know Jesus, they want you to know Jesus. So there's a paper being passed out. If you happen to have a phone where you actually keep all your contacts, you could fill this out right now before you even go home. We have plenty of time. We're, we're finishing. I'm, I'm done, and we have 15 more minutes. So you'll have five to 10 minutes easily to fill this out. If not, you can take it home and bring it back next Sunday. Or uh, I will also email you, text you, uh, and, and encourage you to, <clears throat> to get involved and to uh, fill it in and to send these in. And if you tell me all your friends have died because you're the oldest, last surviving member of your clan, your little group, you, you need another group. <laughs> you need... <laughs> I know, Viv. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> You need another group. You need more people in your life. You, you are, it is not good for us to be alone, no matter our age. And it's good for us to have greater sense of community. So let's find some new friends, if that, if that be needed, that we can really get to know them. So, uh, <laughs> now I just heard that. He said, your name is going to be on my list. Um, if he's already at church, that's, it does not qualify. That will be rejected, sent back, and asked for another name. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not repeating that one. <laughs> Let's pray as Jesus has taught us to. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father.